guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 84, John 16. Man, and so at the end of John 15, here's what I wanna do to set us up for John 16 today. In John 15, verse 26, it says, when the counselor comes, we know even in John 14, where we reference this, the counselor, the comforter, the advocate, right? The spirit of truth. He says, when the comforter, counselor comes, when the helper comes, right? Okay, uh, that's interesting. One says helper, one says counselor here. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, okay? I love that it says the Spirit of truth because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the Spirit of Jesus. Sounds weird, right? But it's true. The Spirit of Christ who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So watch, the helper's gonna come, is that correct? And then in verse 27, it says this, but... Keep going. And you will also bear witness. Man, this is crazy. Our versions are the exact same, but they're totally different on this. You will also bear witness. You will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. So here's the deal. You have the Holy Spirit getting you ready. I think this is a fair statement for something. I mean, would you guys all agree? The Spirit of God is getting you ready for more. What is he getting you ready for? In verse 1 of John 16, Here's where I want us to unpack today. All right, so in John 16, 1, it says, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. Kevin, what, what are these things? What he told you back, that the Holy Spirit's coming and he's going to help you. Absolutely. So the, the Holy Spirit, think about this, you guys. That was a really good way to sound it out, Kevin. The Holy Spirit, there, I'm, not, there's, I'm not pointing to the Holy Spirit over there. Let's go over here. <laughs> All right, I have given you the Holy Spirit to keep you, I've told you these things to keep you from, from stumbling. Okay, so if that, man, this is, this is a lot here. Let's draw something out here, okay? And I know Ryan and Matt love to draw on this, so it's kind of fun to see them get excited about drawing. The Holy Spirit is to keep us from what? Stumbling. What, is, what does that imply? What does that imply if... Uh, how do I put this here? Like, we should expect these things to come at us. Like, the Holy Spirit is given to us to, 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 to prevent us to... Let's go to Psalm 91. Go to Psalm 91 here for a second, Kevin. These are one of the promises that the Lord gave to me in my life in the Damascus Road experience. It's a pretty powerful picture. Psalm 91, okay? It just says this. Kevin, we go to verse 3. It says, He himself will deliver you from the hunter's net, from the destructive plague. In verse four, he'll cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks uh, in darkness or the pestilence that uh, ravages at noon. Scripture continues on and it says this, uh, though a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, the pestilence will not reach you. Verse 8, you will only see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked. Scripture then continues on and just watch as this unfolds. Watch in verse 9. But you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high your dwelling place. So when you go to the Lord, okay, for this shield, for this comfort, for this guidance, for this direction, for him to serve as the presence around you. Now watch, it says in verse 10, no harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent. Verse 11. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. Verse 12, they will support, here it is, they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So let me back up for a second. In Psalm 91, here you have a psalm that is promising, yes, when you walk into the presence of God, look what happens, nothing. You should expect almost like the, in the Israeli world, the Iron Dome, okay? That, that's kind of the mentality. Like literally the Iron Dome when the missiles and the rockets are flying in, like it just somehow it just, it destroys the enemy's uh, uh, arrows, right? The Psalm 91 to me goes back to John 16. It says, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. When you trust and when you, uh, when you look to the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, it'll keep you, the Holy Spirit will keep you from, from stumbling. So it's kind of like an Old Testament image. For me, it's these guys that are going into battle. Same thing, you guys, in John 16. We have to understand we are literally in a spiritual 
battle. The reason we're getting our butt kicked in the church is we don't even realize who our enemy is anymore. And the reason we don't have our, our recognize the enemy is because we don't even realize the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives. So what is this stumbling? What are the things that you should expect to come at us? Well, in verse two, it says this, they will ban you. This is the religious. They will ban you from the synagogues. You guys, we talked about this in John 11, uh, uh, when Jesus healed the, the blind man. When Jesus healed the blind man, what would that have been, Kevin? In John 9? I think, man, they're starting to blend together. Yeah, in John 9, remember, the man that was born blind, right? And so what do they do? They go to the parents. Four times they address the son uh, or the parents, and they say, hey, what's, what's the deal here? Uh, how did this man get healed? And what did the parents say? Well, we don't know. Go ask my son. He's of age. And it says they were flat out afraid of the religious folks because they were afraid to get kicked out in John 9, 22. It says they were going to be banned from the synagogue if they actually addressed Jesus as the Messiah. So now that's what's going to start happening in John 16. You should expect people to be kicking you out of the synagogue. Now, let's just make it reality for Time Revive. <laughs> you know, Ryan and Matt that have been here teaching this week, they are helping spearhead the efforts in their own states along with other folks. We see this as we go into other states. There's a lot of people, it's the religious that don't like us. It's the religious that have a hard time with us. And I'm just going to tell you why. Because they can't control the Holy Spirit that's moving in our lives. They like to put Jesus, they like to put the, the Holy Spirit, they like to put us in a box. And so what's going to happen is, as you continue to walk forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you should expect people to be mad at you. You should expect people to be upset with you. In fact, the question is, if they're not, are you really doing the will of God? And you're like, okay, now you've gone over too far. Are you really promoting to stir the pot? Jesus did. The disciples did. Every time they took a step into a community, it was like a hornet's nest. I don't think he was weird about it. He was just speaking the truth. I think... You know, sometimes we think stirring the pot yeah, or speaking right. that has to be weird and causing trouble, but he was just speaking the truth. Uh, that's a great point. And so here, here's what I want us to understand. The Holy Spirit is going to help us <laughs> learn how to deal with hatred. The Holy Spirit is going to help us deal with people that don't like us. We were just talking about it on, on our car ride here with Matt and Ryan uh, earlier this week about how I remember I had a call from a pastor in Florida and that he had held on to some things for two years. And like, I have to learn through the Holy Spirit, how do I navigate those waters? How do I do it in such a way that I don't stumble into the things that they're coming at me with? And so if you would, Kevin, go to John 15, verse 25. John 15, verse 25, and some of the texts that we, we looked at in our reading yesterday with Revive School. In John 15, 25, it says this, but this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. Now, remember, if we're supposed to reflect the life of Christ and Christ said he was hated for no reason, I think it's a fair statement to say we too might be hated for no reason. And the reality is, is what happens is that when people get hated on, you know what they do? They, 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 they tuck their tail between their legs and they kind of just go the other way. At that point, I would say you either press in or you kick the, feet, uh, kick the dust off your feet and you move on. And so I want us to understand, as we get ready for the return of Christ, did we not talk about this? In fact, we're going to talk about it tomorrow in John 16. <laughs> so fun. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about how do you work through your heart being troubled? Like, how do you work through this process? Well, one thing you need to know is that Christ is coming back. You need to have this expectation. So as Christ comes back, the persecution is going to what? Ramp up. And what I think concerns me is, this is going to sound super weird. We don't see the persecution here in America. Why does that concern me? Because I wonder, well, you could say there's an openness in America, praise God. Or we're not really out actively doing what Christ has asked us to do, which is to share the gospel. And you're like, God, man, why do you always jump off the cliff? I'm not. I'm just, I'm trying to be real here. I'm trying to be honest. This says they hated me for no reason. We should probably start seeing some of this stuff. If you hate me right now, praise God. <laughs> just kidding. Not, not really. You get my point. The Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit helps prepare us for being hated. Psalm 35, verse 19. Psalm 35, verse 19, again, walks through this process. 
of what we should see. Psalm 35, verse 19, Do not let my deceitful enemies rejoice over me. Do not let those who hate me without cause look at me maliciously. Like, I'm telling you guys, the more and more you do the work of the Lord with the gospel, I have to say that, when you articulate the gospel, hatred comes. It, it just, it happens. And so what I want to understand is at the end of John 15, in preparation for John 16, he said, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. In order for you, and I would just say this, in order for you to forget what I've told you, to go back to the old way of life. I don't want you to go back to the old way of life. I want you to keep your hands to the plow and keep going. And the only way you can do that is through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Psalm 69, verse 4. Just, just do one more if we can, Kevin. Psalm 69, verse 4, again, has the same feel about expecting this hatred. Those who hate me without cause, now watch this, are more numerous than the hairs of my head. Well, I mean, you know, if you have hair on your head, you know, then that would be a problem. My deceitful enemies who would destroy me are powerful, though I do not steal, I must repay. Do you, do you catch this? You should expect the enemy of the gospel to come at you. Like, that's the reality. I'm not talking about flesh and blood. I'm talking about the enemy coming at you in every single way. And what I've seen, even within the Time Revive team, you guys, we deal with this, uh, I don't know, it's almost like we become jaded, don't we? It's almost like we become like, oh man, it's another church pastor meeting. Right? I mean, you laugh because we've experienced this. You're like, oh man, how many out of these 30 guys are going to hate what we're doing? Like, that, that's the feel. Isn't that weird? Like, we're the body together. We're brethren. We're brothers and sisters. We should be running together. But I'm telling you, in order to not have that feel, please allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. And just know that if they do hate you, Christ said, oh, that's okay. They hated me with no cause either. They hated me for, for no reason either. And so, in this context, in verse 2, as you walk with the Holy Spirit, they're going to kick you out of the synagogue. Like, literally, they're going to excommunicate you from the Jewish synagogue. All right, let's continue on in verse two if we can, Kevin. It says this in John 16, it says, in fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. <laughs> so now we just went from being kicked out of the synagogue to, oh, by the way, you could be killed and they think they're doing it justice for the Lord. If you would go to Philippians 3 verse 10. Philippians 3 verse 10 talks about, really, I mean, this is exactly what happened to Christ, you guys. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection. I love that line. Remember, we talked about this a, a, a long time ago, you guys. We've used this analogy about to know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Those are the images that you can use, actually, when Peter, James, and John interacted with Jesus on three different accounts. It's kind of cool. So here's the deal. Think about this. My goal is to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Imagine if understanding the way, the truth, and the life, following the way, what if the sales pitch was, hey, put your trust in Christ, and oh, by the way, get, ex get, get ready to, to suffer. Expect to suffer. The reality is, it's coming. We must participate in who Christ is in our lives, and the reality is, the Holy Spirit is going to allow us to give us the strength to deal with the sufferings even to the point if it means death. Can you imagine if you knew when you signed up to follow Christ that it automatically meant death? And the reality is, you guys, that's what we're facing. We're facing because when you address the religious, and it, it, this is so crazy to me, you know who our number one, uh, how do I say this nicely? The issues that we have in a community, it's never with the lost. It's never. Very rarely do the lost come out and protest us. Very rarely do the lost say anything bad against us. It's always in-house. And it's always, you ready for this? It's typically the religious. The only way I can conclude this is, is that you should expect when you begin to walk and flow in the Holy Spirit, whether it's from the well or the river, right, that we've talked about, people don't, have, people don't like when the Holy Spirit moves. And I want to just say a line. The reason that all of this happens, from what I have seen, or at least over 10 years, is that we have taken tradition and that we have had a hard time elevating truth when we really want to elevate tradition. 
It's kind of like this tradition for some reason. It has taken priority. It's like, why do the religious really want Jesus dead? Why do the religious really not like the message of sharing and advancing the gospel? I'll give you a couple of reasons. And I love this. There's a guy named Dan Stewart, okay, from blueletterbible.org. He has a great six letter argument, okay, of why the religious want to bring about suffering for Christ. And I'm going to even say why the religious really want to go after those that are advancing the kingdom of God. One is, is that Jesus' claims, okay, this is one of the reasons that they had a hard time with Jesus, is that Jesus' claims, okay, they outweighed. And this always happens in communities. It outweighed their authority. And this really bothered the religious community. When the followers of Christ walk into a community, when you walk with, can I just say this, his authority, it always trumps the spirit of religion. Always. And then therefore, you know what happens? Pride and control begin to kick in and everybody gets defensive. Kevin, can you go to John 7 verse 48? You know what I loved about Jesus? Jesus didn't care about other people's spiritual authority. John 7 verse 48 says, Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? Verse 49, But this crowd which doesn't know the law is accursed. It, it, <laughs> Man, there's a lot here. Can you go back to verse 48 for a second? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? Go to verse 49 again, please. Ah, but this crowd which doesn't know the law is accursed. The reality is, is if the traditions, the laws, at times, I'm not going to say that I'm lumping tradition and law together, but at times we elevate certain things. What happens is, is that if traditions outweigh the, the truth, then you don't, really, you don't really care about the truth. You don't really care about what the Word of God says. And the reality is Jesus didn't really care about their traditions. It's impossible to please the Lord, you guys, without truth. We have to start focusing on the truth rather than, can I just say it in an American way, on then how we grew up. Does that make sense? On how we grew up, and I'll just say it in so many ways. Well, that's not how the Methodists do it. Or that's not how the Mennonites do it. Or that's not how the, the Bible denomination does it. I don't, I don't care which denomination you lump in. If you are lumping your denomination, if you're lumping your traditions over truth, it's wrong. And the reality is, as followers of Christ, you should expect this to start happening in America. In fact, it is happening in America. What's another component that we have here? Well, what did the, why did the religious people want Jesus dead? Well, one is, is his claims outweighed the authority. And then two, Jesus' deeds outraged. Okay, so we have outweighed and outraged. The religious rulers. Kevin, let's go with an example, can we? What would be one of Jesus' deeds? Uh, healing the blind man. And why did it offend people? Because he did it on the Sabbath. He did it on the Sabbath. You don't, you don't heal people on the Sabbath. You can't do those kind of things. And so his deeds, his works, which testify about his relationship with the Father, they testify him as, a son of, as the Son of God. These deeds outrage the, uh, outrage the, the religious rulers. And so an example would be, hey, you know, we, we were praying in a church and we saw somebody's back get healed. Do you know how much that just starts? It like it creates this like weird animosity in churches. Like you, you can't you can't pray for healing right now. Like how many times have we heard that? Multiple times. How about how about this one? This is super ridiculous. Um, you, you can't baptize that person because you're not ordained or licensed. We're talking about a baptism here. We're not talking about signs and wonders. But when our deeds, when we follow Christ, they will literally outrage, yes, the religious rulers. Every city, every city, when we advance the kingdom of God, there's something of this underlining tone that always happens. Now, you got to understand something. I'm totally for the people. I'm just tired of the spirit of religion. And what I see here, and it says in John 16, you should expect these things to start coming at you. The Holy Spirit, though, praise the Lord, is with you in order to, as you go through, even to the process of, of death. They think they're doing it for the Lord. The reality is it's because the religion just drives them. Okay, so let's look at another reason. Okay, bottom line is this. This is pretty straightforward. You know, Jesus was clearly was a threat to the religious system. 
Jeff, why? Why do you think Christ was a threat to the religious system? What, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, they would have lost all kind of rank. And, you know, when this guy comes in with this teaching that has authority, it's like he kind of was making them all look bad. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they would lose their priesthood almost in so many re in so many respects. Who's this new guy? Uh, there's a line that I was reading, not only in Dan Stewart's line, but then as I was writing this down, I really don't know if this came from me or other people, but I just started writing it down, and I'm sure it came from somewhere. But here's what happens in, in this right here. I, I wrote this. We've created a system to compensate our lack of faith. And so what Jesus does is he comes in, and he messes with our system that requires us not to function by faith. We can literally, we can function, you guys, in day-to-day -day religious stuff without faith. Would you agree? And Jesus is a threat to those that don't want to walk by faith. You're like, what do you, my church doesn't do that. Look, I'm for the church. We are the church. But this is the reality that we see time and time again. And what we want to do is bring life and let people uh, free from all of this weight. And man, I have to tell you, it is a weight. Which is why we need a revival. Which is why we need a move of God in our country and in this world. One of the other layers that Dan Stewart writes about is it says this, not only was he a threat to the religious system, but Jesus was also a threat to their way of life. So not only the religious system, but how they function on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, something is bigger than what they are. And Jesus is a, 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 he's a threat. He's not meant to be a threat, but if you function in pride and control, everything is a threat to you. Everything. So I never understood territories or territorialism in the body of Christ. I've never figured that out. Well, this is my area. You can't come. I've never figured that out. The only thing I can conclude is, is that you're not, you're not free in Christ. Number five just says this. Uh, and I, I promise you, these are communities all over the United States. These are English communities. These are Amish communities. These are religious communities. And number five that Dan Stewart writes, he says, the people, <laughs> this is the, I love this one. The people who Jesus hung out with, with uh, whom he socialized with. What did they do? They outraged. <laughs> they outraged the religious rulers. Kevin, what do we mean by this one? Uh, tax collectors and sinners. Yeah. The religious were the ones like, oh, Jesus hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. You would never catch us hanging out with those kind of people. Yeah, again, I, I do feel like I need my soapbox for this whole thing on this one today. You could be like, oh, we don't play that game. I'm telling you guys, we play this game because many times, and I'm not saying this is uh, across the board, okay? So I understand there's exceptions. Praise God there's exceptions. Praise God there's a remnant in the church in America. But I'm telling you, most of our churches don't reflect our community. They reflect who we want to hang out with. They reflect um, our like-mindedness, but not necessarily our community. And so imagine if you started bringing in, if you're an African-American church, you started bringing in 40 white people, 50 Hispanics, you know, 10 Asians, 17 Native Americans, and about six Polish people. Just had to, why not? And you know, if you imagine you put all of these people together, it's gonna take a while to adjust and to adapt. And if any of that rubs you the wrong way, there's an, there's an ounce maybe of a spirit of religion. No, this is, nah, you get the point. And so Jesus, he introduces for us the opportunity to overcome these stumbling acts, to overcome all this stuff, literally just by hanging out with people. And then the final one that Dan Stewart puts on the table, is, <laughs> this is a fun one. Jesus, he had a lack of respect and this has actually happened to me in person. They say, you don't respect our traditions. Jesus had a lack of respect for their traditions. When traditions don't breathe life into your walk with the Lord, you chuck it out the window. 
Kevin, can you go to Colossians 2, verse 6, 7, and 8? Colossians 2, verse 6. Colossians 2, verse 6. It says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now watch this, you guys. This is so fun to me. As you have received Christ, okay, you walk in Him, right? Now watch what it says in verse 7. Rooted and built up in Him and established in faith. So where is our faith built on? Okay, let's play a game. Tradition or truth? Truth. Rooted and built up in Him and established in faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. Now in verse 8, it says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, ready, based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world and not based on Christ. All six of these, you guys, they can lean one way or the other. Do they lean towards the tradition based on humanity or do they, do they lean towards the, the truth? And it is this truth that will get us through these things. Because look, and says in John 16, verse 3, it says, They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. They're basing it on human tradition, not on truth. And then he says in verse 4, to wrap it all up, But I've told you these things so that when their time comes, you may remember I, I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. Here's a choice that you and I have every single day. Do we want to put our trust in truth or do we want to put our trust in tradition? I have no idea what the traditions you have. And I'm telling you guys, family traditions, they're fun. Things that you do and, you know, meals that you eat. All praise the Lord for all of those things. But please don't ever elevate, okay, those traditions over who Christ is. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, we do that a lot. And so I just want to encourage you guys, <laughs> if this is an issue, Kevin, can you go to Mark 3, verse 26? Here's how I want you to do it. I want you to grab some friends in your church. I want you to grab some buddies in your D group. I want you to grab, you know, some like-minded folks that, you know, believe in the scriptures. And I want you to say, hey, I'm dealing with the spirit of religion in my life. I, I want to be free I want Jesus' box that I have him in, I want it to be blown up. I want all of these thoughts that I think only God can do X, Y, and Z, I want those to be wiped out. How? you got to bind up the spirit of religion. And in Mark 3, 26, it says, And if Satan rebels against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is finished. And then in verse 27, On the other hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have this, this, this truth. No one can enter a strong man's house and rob his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he will rob his house. I actually want you to pray that the spirit of truth, right, will bind up the spirit of religion. I mean, how many of us in this room think the spirit of truth through Christ can literally bind up the spirit of religion? He can. So it's time to not let the spirit of religion take control of our lives and it's time to start functioning by the spirit of truth. All right, guys, this is John 16. Uh, a lot there. It's pretty forward, but it's real. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.